thanks to all of you for being here. Thanks to our panel for being here. And thank you to whoever thought up the quaint title of Printer's Row. Oh my gosh, if only that were still true. A lot of you here are going to hear in one form or another about the epic changes that are going on in journalism and publishing. You all know them, in some cases better than we know them. But uh, it's delightful to see that so many of you are still so interested in the written, spoken, and edited word. And this is what we are here to help you decide uh, in the, if you're interested in these as careers. Let me describe uh, what's going to happen here, and uh, then I hope all of you are loaded for bear with many, many, many questions. There is no such thing as a silly question. There is no such thing as an impertinent question. We want to hear from you. We want to help you. And we also want you to know that we are the gift that keeps on giving, that this may look like a 75-minute panel, but if any of you want uh, more personal handling or continuing handling in your career search, you can have it. Uh, what I want to do to begin is to go down the panel five minutes at a time and have each of the panelists explain who we are, what we do, what we have done, and how we got here because of our time at the University of Chicago. Then when that is done, I will ask some general questions and the panel in kind of a free-for-all way will field those. And then, gang, it's your turn. Then lots of questions from you. And I would ask you, when you ask questions from the floor, please direct them to one or more panelists if you feel you can. If you want to hear from all six of us, that's fine, too. Let's begin down at the end and work our way this way. You're up. All right. Uh, can everybody hear me? Good. My name is Ann Nordhaus Bike. Um, I'm not wearing it, but uh, if you want to check it out later. Um, I brought business cards if you're interested. Uh, if you connect to me, I'll connect to you too. Uh, whatever social media you choose, I'm on them all. I'm delighted to connect with you. So what am I doing here? Um, I, I have two heads, if you will, or two hats, like I think a lot of people on this uh, table do. So I'll describe both of them, and I'll start with the first, which is my degree from the University of Chicago is in art history. I graduated in 1981. I went into art history because I wanted to be an artist, and I took some classes at U of C, and um, it became quickly apparent that wasn't really a great fit. Um, it, I had some negative experiences, but I moved over to art history, and I took an astounding intro to art history class with a fellow named Joseph Connors, who was, was brilliant and, and captivated me, it was magical. So I knew in that moment I wanted to major in art history, and I was really grateful that I could, because I know a lot of people get pressure to major in things that aren't really what they're about, but I was an art person, and so that was a great fit for me. One thing wonderful about art history is it does teach you uh, about writing, because you have to write about art, and you have to do it clearly and concisely. So it was a great fit for me, because I have these two sides of myself, this art side and this writing side. So I ended up in journalism because, of course, after I graduated, you need to get a job. And I knew graduate school wasn't going to be the thing for me. When I graduated, the economy was difficult as it is for, for you now. It took me many months to get a job, but um, I finally did. And my first job actually was not in one of the glam things that you think about when you think about journalism. So I didn't go to the Tribune. I didn't go to the Sun-Times. I didn't go to broadcast. I went to a dental trade magazine. And this is a great career option because there's lots of these trade <laughs> magazines still out there and opportunities for people to write. Um, and let me tell you, it teaches you to write well because you need to write concisely and you need to write clearly about technical things. You not only have to know where the periods and the commas go, but you have to write well and convincingly. Uh, and as a matter of fact, this dental trade publication still exists. It's called Dental Products Report and in fact, your dentist probably gets it. And it's done on a model of it's advertiser supported, so it goes out free to a classified subscription base, and uh, so that's another model to look at. Anyway, that lasted a couple of years. The great thing about it was I met a gentleman, and uh, I'm, I'm married to him now. We've been married for 27 years, and so that was great. Um, went to a lot of different jobs after that in, in business. Uh, I was raised in a home where there was a business on the side. We had printing presses in the garage. We had CompuGraphic typesetting equipment in the dining room. Uh, there were seven children. There was a cottage industry. In addition to my father's business doing uh, aerospace engineering. So I've got this science background from my father. I've got this publishing printing background, ink running through my veins. Two years at the dental thing, it was time to move on. 
So I went to more business forums after that. I went to Ameritech Communications. There was a lot of opportunity in the 80s after they broke up the Bell system. But I got a good break after that. Uh, I had a lot of experience and I went to a place called Hewitt Associates. It's now called Aon Hewitt. It's a consulting firm. And it was a terrific experience for me. I was there for six years and I learned about the consulting world. And that's a fantastic place to be for a journalist. You learn how to write about technical things, but you also learn about business and the care and feeding of clients and that is a terrific thing. But I also learned about myself and what I came to the conclusion was in 1993 I really needed to be self-employed. It was very apparent that I was not terribly happy necessarily being directed by others. I also liked the University of Chicago approach which was following a line of inquiry as long as I felt like it and about things I cared about. So I started ANB Communications, ANB stands for Ann Nordhaus Bike, in 1993 and I've been very happily self-employed since then. We have employees over the year, but we're, years but we are a small firm now. I started as a business technical marketing kind of firm and I did a lot of projects for places like Accenture and Philips Medical Systems, Glamorous, Crips flying to the Netherlands and those kinds of things. Uh, long about 2000, uh, I realized I needed to go back to my roots and I had all this journalism and publishing experience and I had this business experience but I had these things inside me. The artist in me wouldn't be denied and the mystic in me would not be denied. I had been raised with astrology. I had been raised with a theosophical society with other mystical traditions uh, and in a very very liberal faith tradition as well. It was time to come clean and be honest about who I was and to be an artist again. So in 2000 began this trek to turn A and B communications away from doing business communication to communicating the things that matter to me. So in 2008, the day after the presidential election, I thought, okay, I can carry on, it's gonna be okay. And I went Mac and I ordered a computer online that day and I uh, taught myself all the software and in 2011 I launched a new website, we had some other ones, the famous Pinky from the 1990s by the way, which was designed by a technical friend of ours and he made a pink because I'm a girl and I realized I needed more help than that. So now I have this website, A&B Communications, and it's a platform for me to do absolutely anything I want. It has writing on it, I've written a book about astrology and it's an art and astrology book, it's got my paintings in it, the cover is one of my oil paintings. Um, this is a long way of saying I took this long journey. There's not really a career path. I think this idea of a career path is probably a, a little bit of a dangerous thing because you think, oh my gosh, other fields have it so much easier. You do this and then you do that. Well, the truth is that life just isn't really that way. And I'm really glad I had the circuitous route because it took me to this place now where here I am, a University of Chicago person, writing about astrology in a way that's unlike the way anybody else does it. It's math, it's science, but it's also the mysticism. And my art is on my website, and I do videos too. So I have a YouTube channel, I have these cool mystical video, music videos. And how does this relate to my degree? Well, I'm finally doing art and writing together the way I want to do it, and making money at it, and it's really cool. And I have interesting people I can talk to. And the other thing I did in 19, 1983, this is the other hat. And I'm sorry, I'm going a little past five, but I'm almost done, Bob. Um, we started a neighborhood newspaper. This is the other part that you all might be super interested in from the journalism standpoint. Rather than necessarily trying to get a job with a big organization, you might think about in this time of tremendous change what great opportunity it is for you. Why don't you be the one in charge? It's really a gas if you can figure out how to do it. I will say really quickly, this is the Gazette. It is a neighborhood newspaper, but it's a neighborhood community newspaper like none other you will probably ever see. Since 1993, we have won 68 journalism awards, local, national, and international. Um, we have done coverage that has changed the world in some respects. We have had bad decisions in Springfield overturned because of coverage that we did. We kept people from having their houses stolen from them with eminent domain or with other underhanded tactics. We exposed all kinds of corruption and things. It's been really amazing. And what's wonderful about it is we have this unusual business model. And I guess what I would say to you is we're in kind of a wide open time where this, this is a monthly. Um, so it's sort of like a magazine, but it isn't. It's a true newspaper. And one of the great things that we do is we do incredible amounts of political coverage. We are helping to preserve the democracy. We, we didn't cut corners, we kept uh, the high quality. You'll see this is not on newsprint, it's on high quality paper. Um, 
We have people at the peak of their careers writing for us. Um, we cover every single political race that is in our service area, and that's 10 neighborhoods in Chicago. And in the Chicago area, there is an election every three years out of four. That's a lot of political coverage. And we do endorsements. We have political cartoons. Uh, we have fine arts coverage that I started. I, could, I started it. A column about the fine arts in in Chicago, and I did it for 20 years, and that was really cool. A way to use my art history degree, uh, but it was nice because the self-employment model, the starting it yourself model, the being in charge model, is very very cool. And I was really really urge you to think very seriously about it if you can get some experience, and then go out on your own and see what you can do because we we need you. We need all of us contributing. And that's enough for now. Thank you very much. Thanks for your patience. Sure. Hi, so I'm Jacqueline Edelberg, and um, I dropped out of high school and uh, wound up at the University of Chicago when I was 17. And for me, it was like a pure, unadulterated oxygen had just been thrown into my world. And when I got there, when I was my very first freshman year, I decided to take Little Red Schoolhouse. And uh, I remember Joe Williams said to me, you know, or said to all of us, uh, you know, learn how to write because someday somebody's going to give a damn what you have to say. And when that happens, you're going to have to be able to learn, you know, to deliver. <clears> that didn't totally ring home to me when I was uh, 16. So I'm very, uh, it's strange to be on a panel by accident. And, and I fell into this land quite, quite by accident. Uh, I stayed at the University of Chicago through my PhD, and I uh, was a girl Friday there. I was off in Germany on a Fulbright teaching political science, came back, started to procreate the way women do, uh, and wound up fixing a little public school, quite by accident. Uh, but all the training I had at the University of Chicago is what prepared me for this crazy thing of fixing a public school. And then I wound up writing a book about it. Um, and then I went on a speaking tour. And then I wound up blogging for the Huffington Post. And now I have a startup based on that. Um, so I guess uh, what I would encourage you all to do is not to think of your life necessarily as this life-defining choice that you're going to make now that's going to be something that you have to stick with for the rest of your life. Life is a lot of chapters now. Um, and it's fluid and crazy and weird and strange and fucked up. And things get in the way, and they seem like disasters, and then they turn out to be amazing. And you have to be able to roll with it. And I would encourage you to uh, stick to your guns and soak it up and learn as much as you can and write everything you're feeling all the time because that training is invaluable. And uh, where you are now, it might not always feel that way, but you are at the best place on earth for thinkers. Um, and that's just a fact. Anna. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Anna DeVries. Uh, I'm a senior editor at Picador, um, which is an imprint of Macmillan Publishing. Uh, I actually knew I wanted to be in publishing basically from high school, so I kind of kept that in mind all through college. I was an English major. I graduated in 2001. And uh, somewhat uh, a fluke, I think, I got a job while a fourth year. Uh, a literary agent just happened to be living in Chicago and needed an assistant and put a notice on the English department bulletin board that I answered. So I started working for her, still in school, and then once I graduated, I worked full time for her, um, which is slightly unusual. Um, there are not that many literary agents in Chicago, and in fact, she left um, after I did. So um, I then went to New York and didn't have a job for several months and basically offered my services for free to a another literary agent who I knew through friends and worked for them for several <coughs> months. And they uh, were impressed enough with me to help me get a job, um, putting me in front of the right people. Um, and that's how I wound up at Penguin as an editorial assistant. I worked there for a year, and then I moved over to Scribner, which is an imprint at Simon & Schuster, um, working for the editor-in-chief there. Uh, which was a pretty great job because she was a great editor and my very first week there was when she uh, was publishing The Glass Castle. So I got to get on that ride. And that was about seven years at Scribner, um, gradually kind of making my way up the ranks. Uh, it wasn't easy. Um, 
It didn't, uh, it took a long time. Uh, and a lot of that was working with other people's writers. Um, that being said, they were great. Uh, Jeanette Walls, Stephen King, Frank McCourt. Learning as much as I can, meeting as many people as I could in the industry, um, editors, writers, agents. And then um, a year ago, I went to work at Picador, which is a small imprint, as I said, at Macmillan. Um, and we work on our own books, so I acquire and edit uh, a stable of writers. I also help uh, with paperback reprint publishing for FSG and Holt uh, and St. Martin's. So it's um, a little bit of a unique position. Um, it's a smaller company, I love it. Um, in terms of what I've learned or what I've taken from University of Chicago, I can say certainly, as everyone here has already talked about, the critical skills that you gain um, with your classes and your professors, the, the ability to kind of read um, critically and to dig into a subject uh, in, in depth, I think I use every day in my job because my, my most basic job description is getting manuscripts from writers who want to be published and figuring out whether it's a worthy project to you know, present to the wider world. So, um, you know, University of Chicago was the best training ground for that. And uh, I think it's, it's really valuable no matter what job you're in, whether you're, you know, a parking meter maid or uh, an editor at a publishing house to think critically about what you do every day, so. Thank you, Don. Did you vote for Jane Jordan Brown? No. Okay. Um, my name is Don Gutsevich, and um, I'm also self-employed. Uh, I'm a... Uh, translator, editor, and playwright, not necessarily in that order, and I suppose in some respects what I would be, would be talking about or what I'd be emphasizing is that when we talk about career, what we're talking about is something you put together yourself for yourself. <laughs> um, and that especially goes on in the media more than other areas because in some respects the baseline is almost everybody in this room wants to be a writer. Um, that's sort of the baseline craft or skill that will lead you into um, the other areas. Um, early on, I, I actually got a job out of college, uh, which was sort of lucky because I too graduated during an economic depression in the 70s. And um, I think some of it was that I had worked on the Chicago Review all four years of college. And then I uh, was the editor of a special issue of Latin American writing uh, my last year. I split that with a friend of mine. She got uh, Spanish-speaking countries, and I got Brazil, which has been a kind of a continuing joy, uh, Brazilian culture. Uh, and so I had something to show people when I went in. And uh, I think one of the things we'll talk about is portfolio, having something to show. Uh, publishing is still, in some respects, a craft industry, and I think Anna was talking about various editors she worked for. There's a whole system of mentors, and um, which makes it all seem a little bit more arcane than it is. Basically, it's you know it's the same thing as if you would be want to become a silversmith. You have to you sort of work your way up the ranks. Um, translation was not taught at U of C. I don't know if it is now. I kind of came to that. Um, I had a lot of training in languages. The playwright was something I came to a little bit later. Um, I started out writing fiction and gave that up. And one of the things about being a writer is if you are serious about writing, you should be able to make turns and changes in your life. If you are a frustrated fiction writer, you don't have to write that novel forever. You can just drop it and go on to something else. In editorial right now, I kind of earned my bread and olive oil as an editor of textbooks in the sciences, statistics, math. Um, they're highly illustrated. They're a physical process. One of the things to keep in mind if you're interested in book publishing, and even in periodicals, is it's still part of a manufacturing process. I mean, uh, I am part of manufacturing. It, I don't go and work on the press or anything the way Anne's family did, but the fact is, you are working with the physical process. You're not just moving some <coughs> bitcoins around the universe. One thing to keep in mind about publishing is that it is a business that makes a long-term investment in people. So even though it may seem chaotic, and our careers probably do seem chaotic, the publishing is here for the long haul. Most publishers try to keep their authors around for a long time. The other thing to keep in mind is Copyright is your friend if you're all going to be writers. Um, so don't listen to these people talking about intellectual property reform. 
Uh, I have lots of copyrights because I'm a published writer. What do I earn? You know, like nothing. But the fact is it's something that I own and, and you will own your own work. So uh, keep that in mind. And um, <coughs> the other thing to keep in mind is that many of the big startups in publishing and in the e-world are not what they seem. Amazon is basically a distributor. Amazon is not a provider of content. It's kind of like Federal Express, except it has a nicer website. So think about that as a kind of a career problem. Um, but back to sort of the, the basic message is just work on your skills. If you want to translate, translate. If you want to write, write. Um, and then your career will sort of uh, open up in front of you, not necessarily in an orderly way, and you just have to be prepared for that. I'm Charlotte D. Gregorio, and I'm an independent publisher of nonfiction books, and I've been a journalist all my life, too. I've had two careers, really, and most of the time, the careers have gone on simultaneously. And when Bob asked us to address ourselves to what we do and why we do it, I've always had a love and respect for the written word, and I've been involved in a variety of careers beyond just book publishing and being a journalist. And I guess people, you know, when people ask me what I started out as, my academic career was in Italian and French literatures. I got a master's degree in that from the University of Chicago, and I have a bachelor's in Italian and French literatures from Pomona College in uh, Claremont, California. That was in 1975. So I'm 60 years old, and I've had a lot of time to look back on this. And um, after getting my, um, while I was getting my master's, I decided that I really was not not interested in literary theory as I thought I was. And I thought, once I got my master's, I said to myself, well, what do I really want to do? And I had this idea that I, I wanted to be a writer. I had that, I had a gut feeling, and I don't know why. So I went to the career counseling office at the University of Chicago, and I said, you know, here, you know, I'm getting this degree, master's degree in, in Italian and French literatures, and there aren't really any teaching jobs in, you know, Italian and French. Um, you know, can I start out and be a writer? Can I be a journalist? And, and the career counselor said to me, yeah, you know, you, you can go into journalism, but you got to start small. And that was excellent advice because it's very, very true. You start small. So um, what I did was um, I started contacting editors. Uh, I didn't know any editors. A after I got my master's degree, I went back home. My, my hometown is Portland, Oregon. And I started contacting editors that I didn't know by letter. And I took the approach not, you know, hey, I'm looking for a job. Do you have a job for me? That's a very bad approach to, to uh, take, as we've heard from our keynote speaker. Basically, you contact these editors, you get uh, their name, and you spell their name correctly, call up their organization and ask them how to spell the editor's name. You don't want to misspell their name under any circumstances. And you write to them and you tell them, you know, um, this is my educational background, and, you know, I really don't have any experience, but I wonder if you can give me some advice on how to break into your field. And one thing that I learned was people like to talk about themselves. And so I wrote to five editors. And out of five editors, I got um, four responses. One person did not respond to me. Two people responded by letter and gave me good advice. And basically it was, you know, start small and, and, and uh, you know, go to work for somebody who will take the time to teach you your basic, you know, writing skills, journalistic skills. The other two people actually invited me in to talk to them. One was the Associated Press Bureau Chief, and he talked to me for an hour and a half. And um, he said to me, he looked at my educational background that he thought was unusual, and he thought I'd be worth talking to. And so that made me feel really good. Anyway, all of it, I saw a pattern in the advice they gave me. They all said, start small. So I took that to heart. And I, I, I had three journalism jobs that first year. Um, I, st I started out, um, I didn't have to freelance really. I, I started calling up editors. Um, I, I moved back to Chicago because that was a populated area and I, f I thought I could get a media job. 
Um, I, I, I contacted some editors in the suburbs. I mean, my first um, editor was in, the uh, first newspaper that I contacted was in Des Plaines, and he said, uh, the editor said, yeah, uh, you know, I could use somebody, and I, he said, you're at entry level, so you're going to start uh, by writing up, you know, obituaries and weddings and other news that the public sends in. And um, I, I took that job, I, you know, I took anything I could get, it was a minimum wage job, and, but the editor trained me, he took the time to train me, and three weeks into the job, I said to him, gee, I really want to work, I, I, I really want to um, write articles, is, is there some way I can write some articles on my own free time, and, and get them published, just to say that I'm a published writer, and he, you know, I hounded him mercilessly, shamelessly, and all that, and so he, he finally, he gave in, and he let me write some articles on my own free time, and I, he said they were good, and he published them, and then two months later, I um, got offered a job which paid a little bit more than minimum wage, so I moved on. And remember that journalism is a very fluid field where you keep moving and keep moving and keep moving and keep advancing yourself. So I got a job at, uh, with a specific beat. I was got offered a job at another nuclear, uh, another uh, weekly newspaper as an education reporter, and there I could, you know, write as many articles as I wanted to. And I really loved that job. Well, six months later, they ran into some financial problems, and I was afraid that I'd get laid off. And so I started applying for other jobs while I was still working. And an editor contacted me from DeKalb, and it was a, a daily newspaper. And it was a feature editor's job where I'd have uh, an, my own, uh, you know, I'd be the editor, and I'd have an assistant helping me out, and I could produce two newspaper pages a day. And that to me was a plum job because I could kind of be my own boss and I could, you know, write if I wanted to or assign articles to other people in the newsroom. So it was a great, great job. But, um, and then I continued uh, and moved on to other newspapers and got more and more journalism career, uh, journalism, you know, experience. And then in my 30s, I got offered a job as a director of public relations at an organization. And the reason I took that job was because it paid a good amount of money. And I thought maybe it would give me a break from, you know, writing articles and, and the, the, the kind of stress about being a journalist. And at that job, I was able to f uh, found a general interest magazine. So it gave me even more, you know, journalism experience, but not the stress of being a journalist. And after that, I was offered a job teaching journalism, and that was kind of funny because I never took a journalism course in my entire life, not, not one. And here I was teaching jur journalism at Portland State University. That led me to author uh, uh, books. Now, I, now I'm the author of five books. And I also, during that time, I was hosted and produced a, a poetry radio show on Oregon Public Broadcasting. I continued to do um, other work, like I did public relations consulting for businesses. And after that, I became an entrepreneur. I thought, I've, I have all this journalism experience. I have this public relations experience. I've been a published author. So what can I do now? I thought, I can be a book publisher. And so I started a small press, um, nonfiction books. And in 24 years, we, uh, I put out 55 titles, and I also marketed the titles of other publishers. And um, I retired that about two years ago, and now I'm just starting up a new press. And so I've been kind of a jack of all trades, and you know, I still do journalism, I, I still do freelance uh, writing for newspapers. I still, um, as I say, you know, journalism transfers to so many fields. You can do so many different things. And my liberal arts background really, really helped me because as you know, you know, most of you have taken history, political science, public policy. You need all that to be a good writer. You need all that. And, and so the University of Chicago education and all the education I had, liberal arts education, helped me to be a good writer because it, you have to be a critical thinker, as my fellow panelists have said. Now, what does critical thinking mean? When you're a journalist, 
you're going to interview people, and people aren't always going to tell you the truth or they're going to give you biased information. So you've got to have good critical thinking skills to sift through all this and figure out, gee, are they telling me the truth? Well, the University of Chicago taught me that. You know, when I was a journalist, I had a sign on my desk in the newsroom, and it said, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. In other words, you know, I think Bob remembers those signs too. You got to question everything. So my U of C education gave me that kind of good, good anal uh, analytical skills. My education at the University of Chicago was also beneficial in because at the University of Chicago, your classes tend to be very small and professors are always calling on you. So you got to learn how to think on your feet. And thinking on your feet is what a journalist has to do every day. You've got to meet deadlines. Sometimes you've got to uh, write up articles really, really quickly. So you've got to know how to think on your feet. Also, because I studied foreign languages, it taught me to think in a step-by-step -step way. And that's what every good writer has to be able to do. You've, especially when you're a journalist, you've got to explain things in a step-by-step uh, -step way to people. So basically, I got a lot of good training at the University of Chicago, even though I, you know, didn't uh, uh, know I was going to go into journalism, indirect training. And the University of Chicago taught me to be an idea person. And that's very, very important as a writer. Um, so my, my, as far as giving you uh, career, advance, uh, career advice in just a nutshell, I would say be aggressive in seeking jobs. You know, I contacted editors I didn't know. I wasn't fearful of contacting them. I just said, I got to find a job and I need to um, contact editors and I'll do it. I told them about my interesting, you know, educational background. And, and one editor said to me, that's why they invited me in to talk to them because, you know, that was it. But basically, Journalism, like anything else, is a game of contacts. So you got to be aggressive in, in going, uh, in getting out and talking to editors, and they will appreciate that. They will, they will figure if you're aggressive in going out to find a job, you're going to be aggressive as a reporter. So that is, is very interesting. Now, as far as talking an editor into hiring you, when you hear of an opening and you get invited in, Use a line that has always worked for me wherever I've been in the job world. Um, you know, you, you go in, you talk to the editor, you tell them a little bit about your background, you tell them why you'd love working for their publication or organization or whatever, and then you ask them about your careers. And before you leave that meeting, you say to the editor, gee, you know, why don't you hire me, give me a try, and I'll show you what I can do. It works like a charm. And they know, again, they know if you're that aggressive to ask them, come right out and ask them for the job. It's like being a salesperson and coming right out and asking the consumer for the, you know, to buy what you're selling. They know you're going to be aggressive on the job. So the rationale is be aggressive because it, it can only help you. And, and when I say start small, why do you start small? Because the editor will take the time to train you. Don't try to seek a job at the Chicago Tribune or whatever. Go to a, a weekly suburban newspaper, something like that, where it's small enough where they will train you in the basics. And, and you've got to do that if you want to start with a book publishing firm. Again, start small. Go to a, a, a book publishing firm, not an independent publisher like myself, because we usually, we, f we do a lot of the work ourselves and then farm out work to freelance, you know, really experienced freelance people like book designers and, and pe people who do uh, book design um, um, for the general page design. So we hire really experienced people, and we don't really hire interns, but mid-sized publishing company do hire, to, do take interns and do hire editorial assistants, much like the New York firms that Anna was talking about. But they're still small enough where the editors will teach you valuable th skills that you need to know. So that's really, really important. So there's a rhyme and a reason and a method to this. And, and be really logical and common sense about it. But 
Don't be afraid to start small. Everybody does. And people start for minimum wage, work for minimum wage, and that's, you know, that's common. <laughs> panel, thank you very much. I am Bob Levy, the uh, chairman of this panel, and it's a great pleasure to represent the prehistoric wing of the panel. Uh, I love to say that I graduated in the class of 66, but I have to note that it was 1966, not 1766. <laughs> been a long time. I draw a bright red line between my days as the editor of the Maroon and my nearly 50-year professional career that followed from that. I have uh, spent more than 36 years on the staff of the Washington Post as a reporter, editor, and mostly as a personal columnist. I wrote a, a popular daily local column in the Post for almost 24 years had a readership of more than a million people a day for every one of those columns. In addition to that, I have uh, had long parallel careers in radio and television. I worked for nine radio stations or networks, four television stations or networks as a talk show host or commentator. I have been a journalism professor at five major research universities. I have written or co-written three books, Partridges, Pear Trees. Oh, I left out the digital world. I was the original chat host on WashingtonPost.com. I was on the original planning committee of WashingtonPost.com. Uh, if it's about journalism, I have done it, and uh, I still do do it. I say I can draw a bright red line back to the Chicago Maroon because it was there that I discovered a couple of things that have animated most of my career. Number one, that the University of Chicago and what it values and demands are the greatest possible incubator for people who want to get into this business because it requires discipline, diligence, and the ability to work independently. And if you have those things, and I know you all do because you're sitting in this room, you can be a journalist and a very successful journalist. You would never get to this school or through this school without all of those qualities. But to be a success in the world of journalism, particularly the world as it's going to face you people with all the turbulence and change, requires an awful lot of patience, an awful lot of perseverance, and an awful lot of ability to bounce sideways. I think you probably will have that as you go along, but I would urge you to cultivate it. Don't get hooked into little appendices of the business. In order to make a living in this business, you're going to need to do many things well and many things at the same time. But you can. What I learned at the Chicago Maroon was that there is no such thing as no story. There is always such a thing as a great story. And in particular, in our world today, the closer you can get to the ground level story, the better you will do. Early in my time at the Washington Post, uh, I bought into the idea that there was only one story in Washington, D.C., and it lived at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And I was very ambitious, very aggressive, and very lucky. And at the age of 23, I was covering the White House for the Washington Post. Quite a plum. I asked off of this beat after less than six months because I hated it. I hated it. You will never again see or meet anybody who got out of covering the White House for the Washington Post. But I did it because I couldn't get near the story. I spent six months playing gin rummy for money with a sound man from CBS on one of his big equipment trunks. And most of what I got out of those six months covering the White House was about a hundred of his dollars. Otherwise, not a whole lot. I have since devoted most of my professional career to covering local news and local issues, and honestly, I began that process right here in Chicago, because as a student in the 1960s in Chicago, and in many ways still, all these years later, there is an absolutely great story right in the laps of every one of you in this room, and that is the unholy relationship between the University of Chicago, the neighborhood of Hyde Park Woodlawn, and the city government of Chicago. Wowie! You can't do better than that story. And for those of you who have some time afterward, I'll take you back down memory lane and talk to you about what it was like in the 1960s. It was turbulent. 
and it still is in some ways, and if that does not animate you uh, as journalists, I, I don't know what will. I want to close my five minutes by biting off a big hunk of trouble for all of you people in this room, and here it comes. I do not want you to cave into the cynicism and doubt that is out there among your parents about this as a career choice. You have the heart for this business. It is beating. It is why you're sitting in here today. It is why so many of you I've met over this last couple of days work for the Maroon and are considering this as a career. You should do it. Your parents are wrong. They are wrong to say that this is not a legitimate career or a career path. How many of your parents have said, oh my gosh, don't you read the papers? Oh my gosh, papers are folding all the time. This is no place for a bright young person. Well, what do they want you to do? Go to medical school? You talk to any doctor in America, they're all crazy about how terrible medicine is these days, how turbulent it is, how unstable it is. Oh, what do they want you to do? Go work for the government? Are you serious? That is the most turbulent business there is. People in Washington who are politicians say, we can solve all of our problems by sequestering the budget and closing down the government for four days. Isn't that just the career path that you want? So. Please go home the next time you're home and tell public enemy number one and number two that this old guy with white hair said it is okay to be in journalism and publishing. And it is more than okay, it is a great business. And I wanna spend a second about why it is a great business. You people are alive at exactly the right time. There has never been a moment in history like this one in journalism and publishing because of something called the internet. Nobody has this right yet. Nobody has it right in journalism terms, nobody has it right in business terms, and somebody your age is gonna get it right. And that is gonna be totally thrilling because you will be therefore in charge of a business and a megaphone that reaches an audience that would have been unimaginable when I was a student at the University of Chicago. You can do this because the megaphone and the audience is out there to be gotten. Yes, there are many, many problems with the internet and with internet journalism, and there are going to be more, but there will also be opportunities. There will be lots of opportunities for careers for all of you. So, if you want to refer your mommies and daddies to me and uh, we'll fight it out personally, I'll take that one on, but I want you to take that one on because it's your career, your lives, and you cannot aspire to anything better or a time that is better than this one. Okay, what we're gonna do next uh, as you think about your own questions is I'm gonna pose a couple of questions to the panel. Uh, panel, any of you who wanna answer these questions, please do. Uh, we're gonna get disorderly here now. Uh, we're gonna run this like a University of Chicago class. Uh, no Marine Corps, nobody's gotta raise his hands. Anybody who wants to speak can speak. Question number one for the panel. Here we are in 2014 in an era when actual smart people think that uh, uh, messages of 140 characters are complete messages and complete pieces of writing. What do we think about journalism and publishing in the age of Twitter? Have we dumbed this down to the point where it cannot recover or are we simply bouncing sideways into other forms of journalism and publishing? Anybody answer, um, please. I'd like to answer that and follow up on your rousing thing that says it's a, it's a new world. <clears throat> when I say this is a unique moment in history, this is as unique as the Industrial Revolution. Um, not to shame my colleagues or to make myself smaller or something, but I think a lot of this is bunk. You don't have to start small. There are no more gatekeepers. Gatekeepers are done. That is old hat silliness. It doesn't exist. You already have all of the power you need sitting in the chair that you have right now. That phenomena has never existed in the history of the world in the way it does right now, and that's phenomenal. For me to have an idea and blog to 21 million people and in real time see it bounce around the world is intoxicating and cool and amazing and ridiculous. Ridiculous. And that's never happened before. 
And yes, I think you can write profound, amazing things in 21 characters. Chances are, if you can say it really well in 21 characters, you could say it well in 300 pages and vice versa. It's an amazing time. And don't be small and don't think you don't have uh, something that could be said and heard around the world and back again because you already do. Any traditionalists want to jump in here and say something? Yes, madam, traditionalist. <laughs> I want to say something about it. In a, in a lot of ways, I do agree with Jacqueline, but I, I want to say something. I do agree in the, uh, we're a free society, and I do believe in the free flow of information, and anybody out there can get out whatever they want to, and it's up to the public to decide whether what they're writing is crap or good or what whatever. You have to use your common sense. But we still need traditional news organizations because they're, they are our form of checks and balances. And, you know, okay, that doesn't mean that all of the news stories you read from the New York Times or the Chicago Tribune are fair, accurate, and balanced. It doesn't mean that at all. But it's still some measure. Um, there are editors who are overseeing that. And uh, most of the time, they get it right. Most of the time, not all of the time. But we need, we need to be able to trust, to a certain extent, that the information is fair, accurate, and balanced. So, you know, yes, you know, you have all this information available to you through the internet, and that's great. But when I want some really authoritative information, I look at the big names. If I'm looking for health healthcare news or whatever, I go to the Mayo Clinic site or whatever. But you know, you 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 have to have some form of checks and balances, and our traditional organizations offer us that. Okay. Anybody else on this one, Anna? Well, obviously, I represent traditional publishing, and I, I think um, that there's still a lot to be said for that, um, and there's a lot of inherent value in mainstream publishers, uh, Random House, Simon & Schuster, that you can't get from self-publishing. Um, and certainly I add a lot of value to a text that if you were to, if the writer were to just publish it on their own, they would um, not understand that. That's not to say the digital, the digital world, um, the blogosphere, all of that doesn't have its value and I wouldn't discourage anyone from, uh, you know, experimenting, um, from going out into that world, but in terms of you know, whether you want to really be a serious writer and to get better at being a writer, of course, I as an editor, I'm going to say you need an editor and you need a professional editor. So not your best friend, you know, not your cousin, <coughs> not some guy that you met at a bar who runs his own website. <laughs> you know, you want people who have been doing this for years, who have been trained. Um, and that goes for, you know, for any kind of writing, whether it's, you know, academic, whether it's literary whether it's nonfiction, whether you want to be a journalist or whether you want to, you know, create books. Um, again, it's not to say that digital, you know, writing doesn't have its uses, but um, I would definitely say that, you know, there's a reason Stephen King isn't self-publishing. He appreciates the value that he gets <coughs> from his editor, from the copywriters, from the production department, the design department. So, you know, just think about that um, as you go forward, that it's, it's great to, 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 you know, go out on the internet and to create your own site, but... Um, if you really want to improve um, and uh, consider yourself uh, a better writer, at some point you should, you should look into you know, the traditional form. Right. How, but how Anna, many, how many people have taken Little Red Schoolhouse here in this room? One? They're still teaching it, Me too. right? Um, when I left, they were starting to say juniors, you know, leaving up to juniors. Run, don't walk. Sign up for Little Red Schoolhouse. It is the very first course you should take, um, you know, beyond the liberal arts education, blah, blah, blah. But there is not um, a day that goes on where Little Red Schoolhouse doesn't inform my active writing process. And you shouldn't wait till when you're a junior to figure that out. So <coughs> it's, it's amazing, amazingly amazing. Thank you. Don? Um, I think that from my point of view, the whole problem that the internet is presenting has to do with some stuff that Jaron Lanier is talking about in his book, You Are Not a Gadget, and in his other book, Who Owns the Future? <coughs> um, and I noticed they're both books. And in fact, Who Owns the Future has an essay near the end on the defense of the book. The, what Jaron Lanier says that's a real problem that we face, all of us collectively, is that in exchange for what seems to be the free access to information, 
we are being monitored. All of our clicks are being monitored. Um, you know, we can talk about malware. We can talk about uh, slave computers. We can talk about the NSA scandal. We can talk about the Target scandal. So the question becomes less um, do you eliminate gatekeepers because in fact there are still plenty of gatekeepers. The internet has a very strong tendency towards what you might call monopoly uh, capitalism. Uh, Wikipedia the other day was advertising that they only have 115 staff members and they're still begging for money. Um, that's a long way from the Encyclopedia Britannica and all the other uh, encyclopedias that used to exist. So what's happened is that there has been a because, and I mentioned this to the, to the lunch group where I said, you may want to write for blogs, but see if they'll actually pay you. The, the difficulty is, and I think it was Dr. Johnson who said, but writers should never write for free. You shouldn't be giving things away for free. Be, and if maybe that's the difference in my perspective and your perspective. You really have to avoid the idea that writing is something you give away for free because <laughs> your gastroenterologist is not giving you things for free. Your accountant is not giving you things for free. The U of C is really not giving you anything for free. Um, but the idea that the World Wide Web is somehow bringing all this to you for, for free because it's somehow benevolent is simply not true. And I think Bob made an interesting point, which is it's all wrong now. Jaron Lanier is a very strong critic of this, and he was one of the people who developed virtual reality. How are we going to get it right? I and mean, he gives a number of proposals for turning the web into something that would actually pay people. But right now, it's been kind of a massive sort of uh, way of destroying certain businesses. And one of the articles I handed around at lunch said, if you want to see what happened to music and how it's happening in publishing, um, Jaron Lanier also says, what happens when what happened to music? There, are, there really are no music. Uh, you know, there are no uh, music publishers left anymore. Nobody produces music anymore. I mean, all the people that used to produce CDs, there are no CDs anymore. Um, if you want to see how, that, how industries can be hollowed out by digitization, um, just let the internet go in its current format. So back to you, Bob. It's okay, thanks. Uh, I'm going to move this along because we're, we're down to our final 17 minutes or so. Please bank your questions. We'll get to you in a minute. One more panel uh, qu question for the whole panel. Panel, none of us majored in journalism, not a single one of us. None of us majored in publishing because there was no such thing. None of us majored in pre-publishing. And none of these people out here will major in journalism, publishing, or pre-publishing. They will have degrees in things like laws and letters and sociology and philosophy and who knows what all. Help or hindrance? Has it been a help or hindrance to all of you? <clears throat> and what would you advise these students to say as they get into the career world about the fact that the University of Chicago is not a trade school for journalism or publishing? It's, it's done nothing but help me to be uh, in liberal arts. And I think today, journalists as a whole, editors at a whole, as a whole, are a little bit more enlightened than they were when I started. And uh, top journalism schools are stressing liberal arts training, you know, as academic training. It's seen as, as very, very important to, uh, for, for all journalists to have a background in, in liberal arts. Because you can pick up the nuts and bolts of reporting and journalism on the job. What you can't pick up on the job are, you know, things that have enriched you, like your, your history knowledge, your political science. I mean, you, you, you pick those up on the job, but having studied those and going into the job with those is very, very important. Public policy is very important, as I said. And I think it was very, very helpful and very valuable to me to have a liberal arts background. Anybody else on this question? Yes. Uh, Please. Uh, I would say definitely, um, absolutely a huge help to be a liberal arts major, absolutely. Um, if you're at the University of Chicago, we already know that you're smart. Um, Anything you need to learn, you can learn. Um, and actually, you can teach yourself most of what you actually need to learn, or you can get an informational interview with someone who can walk you through it. Um, 
years and years ago, you had to be able to do something called crop a picture. You had to be able to take an actual, and you know about this, a black and white picture, and you had to figure out a proportional way to tell the I people who are going to create it. Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, and if you didn't know how to do that, you might not get the job. So maybe you'd lie, but then you'd go home and you'd get a friend to teach you how to do this. So like in a pinch, you can actually learn some of these things. If I'm, and I'm not advocating lying, by the way. But I guess what I would say also, the wonderful thing about a University of Chicago education is for journalism, you know how to ask the next question and then the next one. And then the next one, and the one after that. Again, it goes back to the, the, the line of inquiry idea. You are going to be an interesting journalist. You're going to be a person of curiosity. You're going to be somebody who brings something else to the table as opposed to the nuts and bolts skills of how do you put a newspaper together. It, it's a way of thinking. It's a way of looking at the world. The other thing is, whatever your major is, that gives you an area of subject matter expertise. You can get a job in that field that happens to be writing about that field. It gives you something else that can kind of help see you through the days if you don't get a straight journalism degree, you know, job right away, or if you're not quite sure what you you want to do in journalism and publishing. So, it's far from being a weakness, I think it's a tremendous strength actually to have that kind of background. All right. Anybody else on the panel? In book Publishing, having a journalism degree doesn't really matter that much for obvious reasons. So you just need to go in and be kind of a sponge. Um, there is a book publishing language to learn, but it's not something that's hidden away. You just kind of pick it up because of book publishing. I mean, it's still sort of an apprenticeship system. Yeah. But, but because, because I was a journalist and had, was a published writer, that helped me get my five books published or soon to be fifth book published because I you know had that background so that's a kind of a a natural open door to you know getting books published okay anybody else on the panel with Anna I'll just please. say the best thing your UFC degree will do for you is in the workplace is to prove how much more uh, you know and how much harder you work than all the Harvard alums that you're gonna <laughs> so. here here now, I've said this to many of you over the last couple of days. Ten years from now, you will be in the workplace somewhere, and you will be around colleagues, and you will be aghast at how much better educated you are than those people. Mm -hmm. And it will yeah. never, ever stop. So back to mom and dad. If they're wondering what in the world that $200,000 is going to buy, it will buy that. I promise. Okay, we're done. You're up. Questions for any or all of us, please, and please use the floor mics when you address us. Specifically to Anna and Don um, about editing and book editing. Um, what's something that you think is, I mean, like, if you could, something like maybe something you would generally think of that you have found has been super important in kind of moving, doing, doing editing and helping people in that sense, for, specifically for, like, books. Um, that you wouldn't necessarily assume would be a great help? Like, what would that be? Um, I, I, the first thing would just be to edit, um, which sounds simplistic, but, um, I mean, it's certainly as an undergrad, you know, working at the Maroon, working at the Literary Journal, the more you edit, the better you get at it. There really is no kind of handbook for editing. Um, it's just tried and true experience and practice, and even today I'm learning more with each book I edit. Um, so, you know, as an undergrad, you know, try and, and volunteer or, or sign up for as many of those publications. And then once you graduate, you know, try and get a job wherever you can at any kind of publication, whether it's a literary journal, whether it's a newspaper, whether it's at a small press, a large press, you know, the more that you can edit, um, the better you're going to get at it. And certainly if you go to one of the traditional publishers and you get a job at Random House in the editorial department, most editors are immediately going to give you a lot of work and you're just going to put, you know, dive right in and that's kind of the, the best way to learn. Um, there is no class on editing. I mean, there are, you can take them, they're $3,000, but you're not going to learn anything more there than you would just doing it every day. So. Um, years ago, I read a book review of a biography of St. Francis of Assisi and the writer said, the amazing thing about St. Francis of Assisi is he always came to everything fresh. So that sermon to the birds was something he did sort of spontaneously. Now, how does that relate to publishing? Um, come to the projects fresh, um, which means that you have to kind of reopen your mind every time. I mainly work on first editions of textbooks and this digital 
uh, interactive chemistry book I'm talking about is also a first edition, and it's a first try by this publisher to do something like this. You, no matter how many years you've done something, um, and if you're in trade, and no matter how many times you've worked with the same author, you have to come to it fresh to get the best thing out of them. Uh, the other thing with editors is I would say, with regard to the English language, you probably need to be a little bit more prescriptive than descriptive. You really do have to sort of tell people why they're not writing English properly. Um, and so you have to think of a gentle way of telling many people that, uh, no, they don't know how to punctuate. The other thing I would, I would just add, and this may sound simplistic as well, but I, I swear to God it's the best thing that I've learned, is just to be reading as much as possible all the time. And again, it sounds you know, the most obvious thing, but um, just by reading good writers, you learn how to write well. And, and again, that goes for journalists or publishing. You know, and the more you read, the better you know, your taste and your radar becomes. So um, this is something you can do now. And all the time and it's something I try and do as much as possible when I'm not working because as much as I slog through first time writers, the best thing is to then, you know, open up a Pulitzer Prize winning writer to really remember what it's like to read good writing. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it cleans your palate and, and, and so you guys, you can do this now and, and um, it's really important. Also read out of your area because what you do is you see how people put arguments a different way. So if you if you're a trade book publisher, mainly in fiction, you, you should be doing things like reading histories of China or you know, reading a, a history of jellyfish or something like that to see how other people arrange information. Sometimes it also helps to go to websites in a language that you can read that <coughs> is not your first language. Um, the, in, one of the interesting things about the internet is that Different cultures have different styles of presenting information, and then you can bring that back to your project, mm -hmm. and it helps keep you fresh. Yeah. Okay. And, and also another yeah. thing, too, uh, just briefly, one of the biggest offenses of authors is that they cannot write economically. They're too wordy. And if somebody has a journalism background and they write a book, they're used to writing concisely. But most people who come to writing a book and haven't had a journalism background don't know how to economize on words. So a book editor, a lot of what a book editor does is, is pare down the manuscript, even take out chapters. Okay, thank you. Also, if I could just add a practical sure, thing too about reading too, and again, this goes from journalism and publishing, is to know what you like and, that, and be very specific about it. So not just I like literary novels, but which literary novels, which kind of writers, why do you like those writers, what about their writing do you like? You know, because it's so helpful for someone who's hiring, when I hire someone, to when I ask someone what do they like to read and they say novels, I, I, I can't do anything with that. But if they say I love David Foster Wallace, I love Don DeLillo, I love the postmodernist, then I know exactly what kind of taste you have. And it's the same thing with journalists, too, when I find writers who are journalists, um, when they're talking to me, they read a lot of journalists, they read a lot of writers out there in newspapers and magazines, and to know what writers, who, they're, who are good, who are writing at the top of their form, it's just, it's the way that you kind of do your research. So it's not just reading, but to, to kind of be able to encapsulate what you read and know why you like it is really important. If More, uh, yeah. If you're interested in highly visual books, also it's excuse me, extend your language to painters, photographers, color, um, design, so that you can say this to someone, um, you know, I like the particular style of that photographer, and then you have something to talk about. It's, it's interesting that, I mean, because I work on highly illustrated books, editors who do that can actually talk about color. Most people cannot even tell you what color that wall is. So. <laughs> Develop your eye along with your literary taste. Um, this is mostly for Anna because you were just talking about like hiring people. Um, obviously, like all, a lot of us are trying to like break into these fields. So, like if I'm trying to break into like the book publishing fields, like what are um, like the things that stand out like before you get to the interview, like on a resume or in like cover letters and things like that, that will get you noticed. Um, internships are really important. Where you intern, um, they don't all have to be in New York, but um, it should be something, you know, that it, it, I'm assuming you're going to, you know, say you want to work at Random House, you know, because, as, you know, there's a whole range of publishing and, and publishers, but to, I'll just take that since that's what I know. 
Um, internships are very important, and at places, at literary magazines, at literary journals, um, at small publishers, um, everyone knows that when you're looking for an entry-level job, you're not going to have a ton of you know things on your resume. It, it's fine. But, um, you know, using your summers to intern, um, you know, I was talking to someone today who interned at McSweeney's. That's a really excellent reference to have on your resume. Um, I don't know the process of getting the internship at McSweeney's, but, you know, again, you don't have to have much, you know, experience. You submit your resume, you go work there for free or for very little for the summer, and that's going to be a big step in gaining, you know, an editorial assistant position at Norton. Um, and then in terms of, you know, once you get to New York, it's, it's just kind of being re ready to interview at a moment's notice. To, if you're wanting to be an editorial, um, you know, certainly you want to apply for those, but also don't, you know, overlook publicity, marketing, production, just to get your foot in the door. Literary agencies often hire a lot more than editorial assistant jobs do. So you kind of want to cast your net wide in that sense. Hi, um, this is for Anna again. You mentioned, you just mentioned literary agencies, and I was wondering how would you compare working at a literary, literary agency to a publishing house, and if you think that starting at a literary agency would be recommended for learning the field? Yeah, I mean, agencies are often, as I said, easier to get into than editorial positions at, at major houses, and oftentimes you read more than you do as an editorial assistant just because you're often going through the slush pile, which is when writers just send in their manuscripts unsolicited. Um, it's excellent, excellent training. You may even discover you'd rather be an agent than be an editor or be a publicist. Um, and again, those ones you can just send in your resume and most agencies are fairly small and they have, you know, you'll get eyeballs on your resume right away. And again, I, I when I got into publishing, I just sent my resume in and said I'll work for free. And I was lucky enough that I was, you know, I had a friend, I was couch surfing, I didn't need to pay rent. But, you know, most people won't turn down free work. So if you can do that, you know, and then work at Starbucks or whatever, you, you know, it's an easy way into the door. And um, I would encourage you to have a little bit of moxie. And you, one of the joys of living in Chicago, not just in the publishing world, but in Chicago, there isn't anybody in this city who won't talk to you. And even if you can't reach them, if you met them in person and you didn't get by their assistant and you said, I've been, you're a very difficult man to reach, um, they would be horrified and, and they'd set up a, a time to talk to you. So you need to have that kind of moxie and confidence right now to realize that there isn't anybody in the city that you want to talk to, that you wouldn't like to work for, that you wouldn't like to learn something for, where you can't start sort of stalking them and asking for, not for a job, you're just asking for advice. You know, I think the old adage is you ask somebody for money and they give you advice and you ask somebody for advice and they give you money. Same is true with jobs. Go ask for advice. I'm interested in what you do. I've done some background, this is what you do. I'm really taken by X, Y, and Z. I'd like to talk to you about it. And sit down, have a cup of coffee, talk to people, and then you can offer something for free, but that's a hell of a lot better than trying to blind send your stuff to people. Panel, thank you very much. Students, thank you very much. A pleasure, and we'll see you around campus.